This is Remote Ruby. Have you any remote idea to the meaning of the word? Chris, I'm not even going to acknowledge Andrew. I just want to talk about you're in your house. Yeah, finally. <laughs> it's been nine months of planning with the architect and like 13 months of construction. So it took forever, pretty much since the beginning of the pandemic. Like shortly after we were like, yeah, let's move out of the city because the pandemic had made our neighborhood kind of sketchy, lots of gunshots and other things. And so we were like, let's get out of here. And it's hard to believe that it's been two years since that happened. So it's nice. It's hard to find stuff. Everything's still in boxes. And like just 20 minutes ago, I found my microphone and <laughs> arm and audio interface and got that set up. And so we're it's a big we're functioning, day. but it's delightful. So I got to see Chris in Brooklyn last week. We vacationed in St. Louis and I tell people that I got lost in your house. <laughs> like it's just, it's, yeah. it is delightful. I'm happy for you guys. So fun story. We move in and two days ago, we've got our access points set up and then cameras set up and we have them around the house, like at the front door and the back and whatever. And we are at Brooke's parents' house yesterday for her niece's birthday party, second birthday party. And I just happened to open my phone and look at the cameras since we've been gone for a little while. And I see 15 minutes ago, our dog's at the front door wandering around and I'm like, Oh no, our dog escaped. One of the doors had to have been left open. So we like fly back to the house as fast as we can because she's tiny. She's going to walk out into the road or whatever. And we come back and we like start yelling for her and she doesn't come. And I go downstairs and see like the back door by the pool is open. And we're just like looking around frantically. Like she's not in the pool. Thank God. And she will like walk back inside and she was like inside, but on the security cameras, when we looked at them last night, she went out the door by the pool, looked at the pool, then went up the stairs and went by the garages, got her head stuck in the fence and then pulled it back out and climbed underneath the fence and then wandered around to the front door and then couldn't get in because there was nobody to let her in. And she's like used to going in and out the front door. And then she disappears for a little while. And then we see on the back camera by the pool, she r comes running up this hill out of nowhere. And so she like wandered back underneath the fence and back in the house. She was like, okay, it's hot out here. I'm bored. And I want to go back inside. <laughs> she wasn't even trying to bail. She was just trying to find a way yeah. to go home. Yeah. She was like, oh, I'll go explore. And then she was like, I'm tired. I want to go back inside and couldn't figure out how to get back in. But she was smart enough to eventually get all the way around to the back and come back. I'm glad we have the camera set up now because yeah. yeah, the house is enough where I apparently didn't shut all the doors from going out and cleaning the pool the other day. So now we have the ring contact sensors on every door in the house. Uh, so yeah. We'll know if anything's left open now. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Yeah. That's scary. Yeah. Well, yeah it was it's, super stressful. It is super cool. Obviously I was there before you moved in, but I love it. I can also tell that I destroyed Andrew by by not acknowledging him. So, Andrew, <laughs> your new house, you recently moved. Your process didn't take near as long as Chris's, right? Uh, no. It took me two hours to pack and put everything in a truck well, that I own. When your nightstand is your moving box, things go pretty <laughs> yep. quickly. <laughs> yep. How is your new place? It's good few issues that I just need to follow up on, but I've been busy this week, so I haven't, but I don't have a working microwave, so I don't either. Better. Yeah, I know. I know you don't. But you're <laughs> weird. We talked about this. And we talked we about have. This. Well, you also thought I was like 72, so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a big that, like that. That's all I got. Yeah, that's <laughs> all I got. Well, today we have a special guest on the show, none other than Xavier from the Rails Core team, worked on site work, gave the keynote at RailsCon. You want to give yourself an introduction? Yes. Hello, everybody. So I am Xavier Noria from Barcelona. I've been doing programming professionally for the last 22 years. My first 
programming job was in 2000. And been, I started doing Java professionally, but descriptive languages it interested me a lot. I was in Chappelle for six years. And then for circumstances, I tried Ruby when Rails came out. And since then I am doing Ruby. I've been doing freelancing for the last 13 years. And I like open source. I've been doing open source in some way or another since the beginning. And yeah, I've been in the Rails core team since 2011. And I am the author of Zyberg, also the author of Rails contributors. If you have your name there in the front page, yeah. Yes, that's more or less. That's awesome. When did you get started programming? You mentioned you, you started programming professionally in Java. Did you like go to school for programming or anything? Not really. So I started programming by myself when I was a kid. Internet was not a thing by then. We are talking the seventies, all right? <laughs> Late seventies, something like that. And I got like a kind of a magazine or something like that. Like, uh, and see, yeah, so something like a magazine that had basic course weekly. So there was that lesson about basic, a uh, short thing, you know, and I was fortunate that my father had a computer at work. The computer was called Triumphalder Alpha Troni. It was a computer without hard disk. It had two floppies and it had a basic. So I could type and play around with things, you know? So I just started that way by myself. I didn't learn programming in university or anything like that. I didn't do computer science. And indeed, I remember from those times in magazines when later you had personal computers like the Spectrum, Commodore and everything, there were listings with pokes and peaks and weird stuff. I couldn't understand what they did because I didn't have manuals. They, there was no internet, so you couldn't check things out online. So it was a mystery for me. So that stuck with me. So I have been always interested in computer programming in a sense, but I didn't go with computer science. So in the end, when I had to choose my degree or my studies in the university, I had like a dilemma because I had this background in computers and interest in computers. But on the other hand, I had like a, a vocation for mathematics. So in the end, I chose to do mathematics and time will say, you know. So it was when I finished the degree in math that I was like, okay, not the time to go and do software. And that also has its own little story. <laughs> but yes. And that's when I started with my first job. By then, I knew a few languages. So basic was my first language. But then you saw a little bit of Prolog. You saw a little bit of common list. There was C in the degree for doing uh, numerical computations and doing some. It was like exceptional, you would say. In general, you do not do programming the degree. But you did C and, you know, a little bit of C++. But for some reason, the scripted languages didn't cross my brother. It was, it, those were different times, right? And so then I started with Java and then I discovered Perl by accident. So in that first company, there was the Llama book, which is the introduction to Perl. We're talking 2000, 2001, perhaps. I don't remember exactly, you know, and that was a revelation for me because I was not aware that you could be so productive with a primary language. It was just the ones that I knew were different, you know, in nature, you know, formally you can understand them. You formally, you can write in any of them, but the level of something like Bell gives you, it was, for me, it was like a different universe, you know, in Java, I don't know today, but in those times for writing a line oriented loop, you had to create an input reader that you pass to buffer reader that you pass. It was like three or four lines. And in Bell, you had the diamond operator. And for me, that was a revelation. Oh man, you can provide this kind of APIs. You can give this level of expression. For me, it was like a revelation. And since then, I was only interested in programming languages. Okay? It reminds me a lot of myself. I learned TI Basic on my dad's old computer and he had an Atari and gave me his Atari programming book, but we didn't have the Atari anymore. And I figured out that 
our desktop computer that had the three and a half and five and a quarter inch floppy could run some version of basic and then trying to like build something that had a an interface was really hard and I didn't understand that. And that kind of led me into like, well, I don't want to build just desktop software or just software for Windows or something. It'd be nice to make it compatible with Mac OS and Linux. And that's what led me into looking at Perl and Python and Ruby. And that was definitely the same revelation moment where you're like, oh, the languages can really influence how productive you are and how you think about solving problems instead of when you're writing C, you're thinking a lot about memory and the internals of how the computer works in a way. Whereas you come to something like Perl or Python or Ruby, and you're thinking more in the terms of the problems you're trying to solve or whatever. So where did you go from there? You said you did some Java and then got into Perl. How did that all go? So I went into Perl. I was fortunate to be moved to kind of a, they call it like a research uh, department in the company where I was working. Since that was kind of research, quote unquote, there were like European projects and the base and the context is different and you have more freedom. So I had the opportunity to do Bell at work. I did also some Python with Python, with Java back in 2003, or it was very early. JRuby was still, maybe it exists, but it was not usable, you know. Python was more mature, right, at that time. So I did a bit of Bell, and I was into Bell and doing open source a little bit. So I have some modules in CPAN. I was the leader of the local group in Barcelona, eventually. And I was a lot in IRC in those days, helping people, that kind of thing. And then what happened is that Ruby on Rails came out. And when Ruby on Rails came out, so my story is not the story of someone that leaves spell for something that they believe is better. This was not my case. So indeed, in my heart, I am still a Perl guy, basically, you know. So the thing is that Ruby on Rails came out and you said, oh, this is different. This is another galaxy, man. We believe there's a business opportunity here. So in 2005, I did a real project in, by my side with another partner to test for real the technology. And the outcome was amazing in terms of your productivity, in terms of the quality of the code that you could write, in terms of how could you react to changing requirements and to adapt to the evolution of the project. And we founded that rig shop in 2006, by right, the beginning of 2006. I was the technical director of the company. And so I got into Ruby. I, of course, I love Ruby too. As we know, there's some things that come from Bell in Ruby that you can recognize. And Ruby also has influences from other programming languages, as we know. But we founded a rail shop and I was the technical director. And the idea of the company, it was an agency for doing projects. The idea was to become the experts on Rails in Spain. That was more or less the idea, right? So we do Rails 2006, okay? That's the run, let's say. So it was my duty as technical director to know Rails from inside out. That was my obligation as a technical director. So I tried to understand Rails as much as possible. And as a consequence of that, you read the source code and you are an open source guy. So it comes naturally that you see something or do, for instance, I had in those days an especially interesting documentation because at that time, documentation was not like a high priority in the project, Let's just to put it somewhere, you know? So I was like, okay, there's room for improvement just in this part of the project. Yeah, so some parts here, there, a lot of work on documentation in those days. And that is how we went. And from there, I've been doing Ruby, well, the company, I left the company in 2009. And by then I became independent. So I've been doing freelancing since then, but always with Ruby. We've all used Rails since 2.3 was when I started, but like Rails 3 was just coming out. And I think we're all, the rest of us are all kind of in the same boat. What was Rails like in version one in those early days? Because I think a lot has changed since then. 
And there was a lot of things before Merb got merged in. And I was just kind of curious, how was it back in the early days? Yeah, so something that is especially related to this was the way Rails boots. So at the beginning, before Rails 3, basically booting was a procedure. To, to explain it simple. So do this, do that, know the roots. It was like a procedure. And that's the main difference. In terms of the feeling, I don't think there was much of a difference in the sense that Rails has always been Rails. Conventional work configuration, extreme love for the APIs, extreme love for making the most common use cases easy to work with, easy to get right, and get out of the way, you know. In that sense, I believe that's the, like the, the DNA of Rails. And, I, and in some sense, I would say that it has been always been there in some way. However, technically, the main change that Rails 3 and the merge of Merv gave to the project was that the boot process is different. So before it was like a procedure. And since then, the concept of engine, the concept of rail tie comes from Rails 3. So those were like abstractions that allowed the boot process and the way to hook into Rails and to hook into the boot process and how to integrate a number of features in an external way. So instead of being everything hard code, let's say there's like clear interface and this abstraction that allows you to hook into the framework. That was the main change internally. And of course, if you want to write plugins or engines, that's an external change also, not only in the implementation, right? That which is the point in the end. So is that the same release that Bundler became a default for managing gems? I can't remember because I, I remember I starting, remember either. like my first Rails job was for a professor at my university and I had a Linux laptop and I spent like two weeks trying to install and run their app. And I was compiling things and trying to get dependencies like image magic or whatever working. But one of the things we noticed is like you had set config.gem and the gem name inside of application RB or something. And somebody hadn't specified the version number. So we required like not the latest version. And I spent forever trying to figure out how to get this app to even run. And it was one of my other coworkers eventually that was like, oh yeah, you need the older version of such and such gem. And I was like, oh my gosh, why didn't anybody like write this down or leave a comment or something in there? And that memory always stuck with me because I was like, it shouldn't be this hard to get code running. And it really feels like since Bundler became a thing and people started to learn like, okay, we need to specify the versions on everything and make sure that a major version can't just accidentally get up installed or updated or whatever. Yeah, there was a lot of little nuances that weren't as polished back then. And it was an interesting time, I bet, for a lot of applications. Yes, it was around those years. I don't remember exactly if it was released with Race 3, but it was definitely in the Race 3 days. And interestingly, I believe we cannot imagine today a world without Bundler or without that kind of feature because of the determinism that gives you to the project. However, you may remember that Bundler got a lot of backslash from the community in those days. It was very controversial. So it took some time. Maybe, I don't know, maybe it was not as easy to use or in the first early releases. Or maybe there's some technical details there or whatever. But it's interesting from a social point of view that there was a lot of backlash. I remember a conference, I don't remember where, but I remember a conference where people were like, you are going to put Bundler by default in the next Rails release. So yes, that's the plan. Okay, okay man, impossible. I quit. This is nonsense. You are putting, you are forcing this onto people, you know, that kind of argument. And time passes and nobody remembers that. So that's the, in the end, the technology wins. It's a good solution to an existing problem, you know. That's fascinating. I guess that all happened before, like, Bundler was already there and I came. So I knew about none of that. I have trouble imagining a world without it. So it's fascinating. Exactly, man. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> That's so funny. One of the things you mentioned several times is open source. And 
I'd love to hear what about open source catches your interest? Like, why do you like it? And why do you do open source? Because I think a lot of people have different reasons they like doing open source. And for me, it was like, I got my first computer, installed Linux on it. And I spent sometimes like eight hours a day on the Linux forums, learning how to like set up my computer and get different features working. The graphics card was <laughs> exceptionally hard in the early days of Ubuntu. Yeah. And I remember just feeling like really grateful to everybody that helped. Like I got all of this figured out and I wrote a tutorial about it and helped other people. And there was like a college kid that had written some Ubuntu configuration tool in Python and you could go like check boxes and install the stuff and it would take care of all the little nuances for you. And I remember being in high school or whatever, and I was like, I want to be like that guy one day. Like, I want to be building tools that the community loves and just give back to all these people who wrote a bunch of software for me to use and benefit from. And they didn't expect anything in return. They were just doing it because it was useful to them and might as well share it with other people. And that has always kind of stuck with me and been the fulfilling thing that makes open source awesome for me, at least. So I was curious to hear from your perspective, what got you into open source and what do you like about it? We have a very similar experience and motivation. For me, open source is all about, as you said, there are multiple ways to approach open source and people get different motivations. Some of them, like the free software people, for instance, they have like a understanding of ethics, you know, and philosophy, you know, that do free software because of the things they believe in. So there are other people that maybe try to seek popularity or promotion or, you know, public exposure. There's different ways to approach open source and every person is different. In my case, it's something that just clicks to me. It clicks to me the sense of collaboration in the open just for the sake of it, just to have fun together and do that in the open. For instance, when I was starting programming, by that time, there was something called Usenet. Usenet was like a forum to explain it to people born later than me. <laughs> so it was like a forum for all kinds of things. And in particular, there were forums for programming languages. So I remember in Comlan C or Comlan Java Programmer or Comlan Perl Misc, absolute gurus of those languages, people that knew the NCC standard from A to Z, people that knew the Java language specification by the comma. I mean, you could tell because of the quality of the answers and the detail about what's undefined behavior or not. It bell the same. So you see all these world-class people just sharing their knowledge with other people that are starting or that just, they have questions. Then you run in your computer a lot of open source software. To me, is just sharing things in the open and collaborate with people for the fun of it. Plus, I love doing computer programming. So those are the three things that bring me to open source. In the early days, in the 2000s, for instance, I remember colleagues at work that didn't understand because by that time, open source was not as mainstream as today, perhaps. Okay. I am talking about the 2000s. 2000, 2001, whatever. And they were like, so you've been doing programming during the day. You go then home and continue programming and for free and you share it with people. Yes, I do that. Why? Because I like it. I don't know. I don't have any more rationalization than that. You know, if you like playing football and you go with your friends to play football, you do not ask yourself, what do I get out of this? You do not need to answer too much questions to yourself. You like playing football. You like having a fun time. That's the end of the story. So that's the end of the story for me for doing open source as well. And yeah, so I've been doing that since the early 2000s, some way or another. And maybe it's like the romantic way to see open source in a sense. Sharing things for the fun of it is like an altruistic also way of living, you know. Those are my thoughts about open source for me personally. Yeah, I can relate to that. And there's a funny thing that people can't imagine that you write code for work, but then you come home and still enjoy doing it. Most people 
have their day job and they don't like it. And they can't imagine doing that at home for fun. And it's the reason why we became programmers in the first place, because it's really interesting. There's lots of problems. It's fun. And we get the benefit that we can get paid to do that too. So I'm with you wholeheartedly there because that's why I got into it. I had video games on our DOS computer and I was like, I wonder how they work Mm -hmm. and tried to recreate video games for fun. And then like in high school, it was like writing code to solve math problems and try to cheat on my homework, but I accidentally learned the math because I'd write the code for it. And it tricked me into learning the math. And I was like, this is fascinating. It just goes from there. I just want to take a minute to thank our sponsor, Honey Badger. They are not only my favorite error and uptime monitoring service, but they've also added several awesome new features. One of those being the public status pages. So it makes perfect sense that your error and uptime monitoring tool can have a public status page for you to communicate any downtime outages with your customers. So whether US East 1 is down or you forgot to add a configuration file, Honey Badger is there for you to help communicate any downtime or outages with your customers. Plus, they've also added SSL certificate monitoring. So like many of us use these days, Let's Encrypt certificates expire every 90 days. And if for some reason you're a week away from expiring an SSL certificate, they can let you know ahead of time so that you can take care of it without any outages for your customers. Plus, managing the errors and things inside of Honey Badger has gotten even easier with Honey Badger Actions, which you can use to automatically assign errors to yourself or another team member, add tags to different error classes and more. And they also have batch actions, which you can use on the search results to help manage your backlog of work to do. So Honey Badger is the place to check out for error and uptime monitoring, and it's only getting better. So check them out at honeybadger.io. So you got into doing open source and Rails being an open source project and you're at the agency. When did you join the Rails core team and what led into that? Because obviously like... You were there in the very early days of Rails. You had to learn the internals. You're into open source. So obviously like contributing back and getting involved is an important thing. So how did you end up getting involved in Rails and the core team? Yeah, so it was a gradual natural path. The thing started with being interested in documentation. So documentation is something that is very important for me in any software project that is at least public. Maybe I, I do not document with a level of detail for my own projects. Depends on who is going to use it. And to me, there was room for improvements. Also, I had a background in publishing because when I was doing the degree and a little bit later also, I was a proofreader of math textbooks for publisher. So. I had my eye trained, you know, in doing proofreading and details and typography and spaces and all kinds of things. I did that for six years professionally. Also, I had this uh, natural tendency to look into the documentation from this point. But by that time, there was something absolutely brilliant, in my opinion, that Pratik Naik did. Pratik Naik was in Rails Core, but by those years, he's one of the alumni of Rails. Did something that was absolutely brilliant. He created a branch of Rails, called it .Rails, and that branch had, listen, public right access. So anybody could write to that repository. You didn't need permission. It was public right access that doesn't exist today. But it existed, GitHub, that feature, you could do that. So Pratik, this is brilliant because normally the commit bit is something that is super precious. You know, it's, the commit bit is something that you only give to someone that has earned it. And that's reasonable. That's normal. Okay. So it, this is so ingrained that thinking about giving public right access to something is like the epitome of lateral thinking. You know, it's like, how can you even come to this idea. So he did that. And that gave me the opportunity to go full speed working on documentation. Public writer says, for real? Yes. So you're going to see. (laughs) So I worked a lot on the API. 
And then the Rails Guides project came to life. So I worked a lot on the API documentation and then the guides were launched. And in those times, there were no Rails Guides. That was new. So it was like helping people with the guides in all kinds of senses, from the content to the editorial aspects of writing a guide, the little framework that's there for generating the guides, or how do you publish them, that kind of thing. So that was what got me very close to the project and getting more and more in contact with the team and more and more in contact with the internals of Rails and how things work, etc. You also did, you know, your occasional code patch, but in those days, my focus was this, try to improve this. So I purchased the server that runs, that hosts the documentation, because in those times, generating the documentation was a step that you had to do on release. Okay. When people releasing had to generate and had to are sync the generated file somewhere or something like that. So what happened is that that sometimes didn't work. Sometimes people forget whatever. And I was like, okay, I can take ownership of this. So I got a server in DigitalOcean and I paid the server myself. And I've been paying that server for, I don't know, for a ton of years. <laughs> yes. So I set up the server and I set up a way to automate the generation of this documentation. And with that, we could have documentation for master, which was the name of the branch by those times. Those are the edge guys and the H API that came to birth in those times. So this was like something, a contribution of mine in those early days that put me, you know, in close contact with the team and with the project. So after that, I worked also in some code and eventually that is how it works in Rails code. Okay. So eventually. You see, okay, it's going to be easier for me to give guy commit than to monitor everything that he does because he has proven with time. So that's how people get commit B. It's a consequence of your work. So eventually I got in the committers team, which is a team. There's five people, I believe now in that team. The committers is a team of people that have right access to the repository and they can merge pull requests as a committer, you can patch the code and the only thing that you know that yeah. you, you have to use the commit bit wisely you know so for instance big things that could have a big impact on apis or on the vision of, of where do you want to head the project or that kind of thing maybe it's better to coordinate with core to be sure that everyone is on the same page on whether that kind of change fits with this vision or not you know or security or releases that's something for core, okay? The policies, the releases, the security, and the vision, okay? That's core in addition, of course, to working in the project itself. And more or less, by that time, I got an award, which was an honor for me and a recognition of all this work, which was the Ruby Hero Award that was in 2010. And one year after that, I got eventually invited to join the core team and she's dead. That is an awesome story. And I think it's a great point to make that like you get on the committers team from just being there and doing open source contributions and your work will eventually be, you know, noticed by everybody and they'll be like, all right, well, why don't we just include this person with the commit bit? Because we've seen their work and we trust them. They've done a good job and that's how you build the trust in a open source project like that. Just show up and be a part of the community, I think. So that is a good answer for a lot of the people who are curious about how does the core team and the committers team and everything like grow and change? Well, it's that. It's just how an open source project works. People show up. Some people that are there for a couple of weeks and do a bunch of good stuff, but then they're gone for a year or something and that's fine. But probably more often you'll invite the people who are consistently there and contributing, I would imagine. Exactly. Sometimes I get the question, how do you get to Rage Core? It's a question that takes me off of guard because it's a strange question for me. There's no algorithm to go to Rage Core. It's not, there's no procedure. It's exactly what you said. It's like a very common sense and very simple way of working. I mean, you contribute, 
eventually your contributions will be noticed if you are there and people notice and then internally we say, hey, look at this person. Interesting. It's great job. They did this, they did that. Maybe we should invite them to, if they are interested in, for instance, in being a committer. There's no lectures. There's no, this is just a conversation, you know? Oh yes, yes, let's do it. And for core is the same thing. For core, I believe if I am not mistaken, everyone in core has been before a committer's team. Well, I do not know if in the entire history of race, there's a, a counter example to this, but more or less that's the way it works. And it's the same story. So someone is in the committer's team and eventually if they do like great contributions and they are consistent and you have to see a certain level of maturity, a certain level of alignment with core principles of the project and a certain flight hours, you know, I mean, that's common sense to me, you know? So eventually you say, Hey, why don't we invite recently three people joined at the core team? And it was like that. And it has been always like that. That's him. Yeah. It makes a lot of sense. And it's just the natural way of doing things. I think the community is excited to hear that three new people on, are on the core team, especially over time, people come and go and it's always good to see new faces and a lot has changed in the last couple of years, I feel like too. So it's awesome to see those new contributors. When you joined the Rails core team, was it sort of having them seeing your work on the guides and things like that, that kind of like got you invited on there? Yes, it was like that. I mean, you got the commit and I don't exactly remember what I did in that interim year to say some code because my motivation in open source is always something that I personally want to work on. So to say it's on code, it's not like I go to the issue tracker and pick something. That's not the way I do it. Okay. That's one possible way for you to get into open source, but it is not my way. There has been always a personal motivation. I am truly motivated to work in documentation. Let's do it. I have hit this back. Okay. Let's understand the back and let's fix it if possible. You know, for instance, the biggest one lately has been auto loading. Auto loading for me was a pain point and it was something that I wanted to understand. And if possible, I wanted to fix. That's like an internal motivation. It's like something that you want to do for whatever reason. And that became Zyberg and the story of the project and everything, you know? So I don't remember exactly what I did in that interim year. Probably I was still very into documentation because improving the race documentation, setting the guides and, you know, I wrote also those days, the active support for extensions guide, and the auto loading guide, the first one, you know? So I don't remember exactly what I did. Certainly I did some, also some work on the code base. To be honest, I do not distinguish code from documentation. To me, it's everything is the same value. Everything is important for the project. Okay. I, don't, I do not distinguish code from tests, from documentation. So to me, it's everything is contributing to the project. And yeah, it was just a matter of continue doing what you were doing before with a little bit more of maybe consideration and being careful to use your commit bit wisely. So do some changes to the code base and you try to make code changes that make sense in the context of this particular project. So eventually you got invited to a core team and there's no like a list of requisites that you had to, you know, fill. It's just that organic process. I really like the point you made about one approach is if you want to get involved in open source to go like look at the issue tracker, but it's a lot easier in some ways if you find a, like a bug that you ran into that you want to go solve because you have your own motivations there. And I think that was just a useful little nugget that for me personally has been, it's hard for me to go to a project and just get involved looking at the issue tracker because I don't not particularly invested in any of those specific problems. It was something that I did in the beginning just to like poke around and like see if I can understand somebody else's issue and replicate it and then maybe solve it. But once you start building things, I think there's a lot of times where you run into, oh, it's hard to do X, Y, or Z. Maybe I can contribute back and solve it for myself and the community at the same time. 
and really help a lot of people instead of just your own application or yourself or whatever. And I think that's one of those that led into working on auto loading and site work. And I was going to ask, when you started that, did you have a good understanding of auto loading? Was it something that was like a problem that seemed scary to you? Did you have an inkling of how it could be solved? I'm sure there's been a lot of people who are like, yeah, this doesn't work super well and I would love to solve it, but they maybe didn't dig in deep enough to like really understand the problem set or they're just afraid of like, oh, this might be a really big challenge. And sometimes maybe you just have to be naive about it and like, oh, I'll just see if I can figure it out and not realize how big of a challenge it is until later when you're like six months into the project or something. But <laughs> I'm just curious, where were you when you started working on site work? So autoloading was a topic that interested me. First of all, as you said, it didn't work quite that well. So it was super useful and has been used super useful for many years because it has allowed us to work without requires. And that's something very convenient and we have been able to reload and that kind of thing. So super useful feature, however, didn't work. It had gotchas. It had situations in which the software didn't do what, what you would expect. And that problem, for some reason, interested me. So why does it happen? The difficulty here is that uh, constants in Ruby is a deep topic because in Ruby, when you create a class or you create a module in the usual way with a class of module keywords in a regular code, Ruby really is creating a class of module object and storing that object in a constant. And from that point onwards, they are absolutely decoupled. They have no relationship. The constant is a storage, like a variable. If you say class C, when the class object is stored in the C constant, Ruby sets the name of the class. And it says, okay, you're going to be called after the name of the constant or the constant path if you are in the context of a constant file. All right. So which is your, your name? C, a string. Well, the C constant, you can delete it. You can store the C class in a D constant or in a Y variable, because that's the Ruby model. Everything is decoupled. And when something is so decoupled, the consequences of that is that you cannot rely on anything. Everything is so flexible that the side effect of that is that precisely you do not have constraints in a programming language where you have like a strict constraint, like this is an alien space and this is what you can do. And types, a type is a type. It's not like in Ruby. Ruby, Ruby does not have type. Ruby does not have syntax for types. So the summary is that technically the situation was very interesting. In addition to that, the situation was undocumented because there was no documentation of our constants. It's, it still is a very lucky part. Lucky. I don't know if I pronounce it correctly, but you know, it's missing. There's missing information about how that works, you know? So I had basically to reverse engineer how things work, poking, you know, and like checking things. We are talking about 2010 or something like that. So many years ago. And I started to understand how constants work. I remember Charles Nutter in, in Amsterdam. In those days, I was talking with him about my discoveries. And he was like, you are doing the same thing I had to do to write JRuby, which is understanding this thing. <laughs> best you can, poking of things. And so the outcome of that work was, okay, you know, I understand why the autoloader doesn't work like you would expect in some situations. And now I see the fundamental issues because the problem is that this is not a bug. This is not something that you can fix. The problem is the technique, the classic autoloader used was fundamentally limited. There's missing information and there's, in addition to missing information, the way you get execute is insufficient to be able to replicate whole Ruby load constants. And therefore you're going to have situations in which you expect certain constant to be resolved and you get another one, but you get the constant missing for it. So that groundwork gave me an understanding of how Ruby constants work. From there, I could understand the limitations and the implementation of the autoloader, 
And I wrote the guide that starts with a big section explaining how constants work in Ruby. That was a section that I was personally questioning myself if I should write it or not, because that's documentation for Ruby, not for Rails. So why I'm documenting constants in Rails? Well, I tell you why. Because you need to understand how constants work in order to be able to understand the section that comes later, that is the voucher section. So in order to understand the voucher section, which is, I am in this situation. So then we have the same context and I can document, okay, in this thing, in this particular case, what happens is that since we saw before this and this and this and this, therefore this and this and therefore the constant is not full. And the workaround is this one. That's why I wrote the section about constants. When I studied constants this way, I saw an alternative implementation that was possible and that could just work. Totally different approach. And that is what I explained it in the keynote in RailsConf this year. So basically there was another possible implementation but there were some blockers that prevented that implementation from being written. Like they were lacking things in Ruby. So if this and this and this could happen, then I think I have a solution for this. But this took years. So we are talking from understanding the problem and, and envisioning the possible solution in 2010, 2011, that's those years, up to 2018, where I see not 100%, but almost that we are now ready to try the new approach. And that was the beginning of the Zyber project. And that would be like a long story. <laughs> you reminded me of my first open source project. I had a problem where I was, I had this new laptop, I had Linux on it and I needed to install software on it, but that's not downloading an installer like you do on Windows. You you know, apt install your package and it finds all the dependencies. And we had dial up and my project that I ended up doing was I reverse engineered how it figured out what packages and dependencies needed to be downloaded. So I like just had this personal problem and was like, oh, I'd be curious to see how this works and replicate it. You know, it's all open source. It shouldn't be that hard to figure out. And I like sat down for a long time. I had to learn a lot of things along the way, but it was one of the most fulfilling projects. And I imagine site work feels similar where you're like, yeah, auto loading could be better, I think. And I'm just going to see if I can figure it out. And that is a really cool thing to see. And I remember you mentioned it, RailsConf and like watching the repository too. Like it's sort of a project that is, it has a nice completeness to it. Rails will always probably have more major features and big changes all the time with active job and active storage and action text and whatever. But SiteWork has a very nice kind of concise feature set and like it can be kind of finished at a certain point. And I remember when DHH published the name of person gem and he was like, we've been using this code for a long time. We'll probably not accept any like major changes to it. It works great and it's kind of finished. And when you mentioned that, it reminded me of that as well. And I remember people being like, that's not possible. Software is never finished. And I thought that was funny because that's the typical understanding of software that it's always going to be changing and whatever. But I think some things can be nicely confined and sort of finished in a way. Absolutely. There's a great name in Pell, one of the best, Mark Jason Dominus. He had a, a lightning talk about this and he was like, I have these modules in CPAN. Basically they are done. There's nothing else to add. And then people come to me and say, is this maintained? Yes, it is maintained, <laughs> but there's no activity because there's nothing, there, there's nothing new to do. It's, it's done, you know, but I am here and if something happens, it is maintained. And you are totally right. There's like this conception that you should see always, you know, like the history of Git moving. Otherwise, it's a bundle. Not true for some projects. Some projects, like what you said, they have a specific scope. And once that the scope is covered, well, it's mostly done. And Zyberg, I believe, is mostly done. So, for instance, now I am thinking 
about giving support to extension gems. So there's a one convenient helper, call it for gem that allows you to, in, to instantiate a loader that is fine tuned for gems, for gems conventions. And it's just a convenience, but it's just with one line, you can get a loader configured with a standard, you know, way to sell gems. No, this one liner does not support today extensions in the sense that you have dashes in the gem name. So if you have full dash bar, you are supposed to be in the directory full bar. Okay. And you are supposed to require full bar your entry point. So your entry point is not at the top level. No. So that's the convention, you know, in Ruby gems. And typically full bar is not your namespace. That's the namespace of the thing you are extending with your gem. That's the convention. Okay. So for instance, I am thinking if I could add support to the for gem helper, so that if you say for gem and your project has this shape, automatically by default, you can always overwrite, you know, but by, by default it's going to understand which is the name space and the tag and where is the version file going to be and those little convenience so that you get it done. A recent addition was also, so I checked some projects that used the gem. So Jiver, um, I am talking about gems in particular, and this happens also in Rails applications, typically when they add deep to the autoload paths, which is that in Jiver, by convention, if you have a folder, if you have a directory, that is defining a namespace. Those are the rules. Those are the project rules. If you have a, a directory, that's a namespace. If it has a file with RB extension, it's going to be defined in there, but otherwise it's going to be a module. In any case, it is going to define a constant for that folder. What happens? So for instance, a gem that has rail generators, it has its own thing. But then it has lib, for instance, there's several options, but one option is lib, rails, something, generators, my generator. So that gem has Ruby files in a place that is not going to be autoloaded because rails is going to do a require and it's going to find it because it's in the load paths DOM. That gem has a rails name space that by the conventions of cyber, could be even managed a driver if the gem is using, is using driver because there's a folder called it rails in lib. So if you don't say anything that is telling driver that this rails directory should be managed by the loader, but that's wrong. So I added a warning. That's something that you learn just from paying the gem used, you know, and you say, okay, people do not realize this. Let's add a warning. But as you see, that's like the last mile. It's like polishing. But feature wise and the horizon for this gem is basically it is done. Also, fortunately, it doesn't have bug fixes. It doesn't have bugs. It doesn't have issues. <laughs> done. It's done. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. It is one of those things that it's got to be so satisfying for you that like you wrote code that you don't have to maintain it. It's solid. It's really reliable. It doesn't have bugs. And it just works. It feels kind of rare, you know, writing software like that. So this is kind of done. You have some polish to add to it, of course. But are there other projects you want to take on that are similar to this that you've noticed over the years? And maybe even as you were working on site work, you spotted other areas that could be improved. Is there any future plans or projects that you want to take on? So my next steps are on the polishing side. So the previous autoloader had been there since the beginning. There was a transition period in which you could choose either the two of them ship it with Rails. Okay. That happened in Rails 6.0 and Rails 6.1. Now, this area of the framework, there's room from improvement here from polishing, let's say, you know. You couldn't quite do that before because you had to maintain both autoloaders. It was a, tr a transition period in which the focus was, let's ship the two of them. Let's do this the best we can, but you didn't have a lot of freedom to move things because you were shipping still the two of them, etc. No, in RAID 7, the classic autoloader is no longer shipped. So 
now we are in a situation in which auto loading has gotten way better. And since it got way better, now we can think about polishing the last details, even a better interface or given better experience in some places that are like details. But in details, you have this amazing interface or this so-so interface. Sometimes it's not just the code or this how you design and which is the API and how it works and what do you get by default is all, all those kind of things that gives you this magnificent API. So there's room for improvement in Rails, for instance. Let's take one extremely simple thing. Config, config, cache classes. We have had config, cache classes since forever. Config, cache classes is a Boolean, it's a flag that tells you if you want to reload or not. As we know, I've been in quite intimate contact with autoloading. I know my way around this topic. And every time I write or I wrote config dot cache classes, I had to stop for a moment and think I make sure that I'm getting the flag correct. Why? Because to me, the name is not obvious. We're talking about a name of one configured parameter, but that's extremely important because everyone has to write config cache classes. So cache classes, when you write Ruby and Ruby does not have reloading, things do not change. You load this class, you load Nokogiri, you load MySQL, you load everything. Do you have in mind that classes are being cached? I don't think so. Classes, you define classes, period. That's the end of the story. So it's like a foreign concept. But if you say, please reload, is reloading enabled? Man, I do not have to spend one cycle of brain, you know, and understanding that configuration. In the main branch, no. A config cache classes is going to work, I guess, forever because you, you cannot break that. Well, maybe you can do like a, a very long deprecation cycle. Why not? But in main, no, you can say config dot enable reloading. And then you have to predicate config reloading enable question mark. Easy. Another one, people sometimes push the uh, to the auto load paths and do not remember to push also to the eager load paths. And the way Rails works, if you push to the auto load paths, but not to the eager load paths, when you eager load in production, typically, those directories in the auto load paths are not eager loaded. So we discussed this with the team a few days ago, and the conclusion is, why do we have this difference between auto load paths and eager load paths? Because for historical reasons, but do they make sense today? Probably not. So at least this is going to change in the sense that if you push to the auto load paths, that is going to be eager load. In the rare case that you have a real motivation for not eager loading something that you want to push to the auto load paths, then you can reach to the loader's API, which is public. So it is public that you have the loaders in this particular, you can access the loaders this way, like rails.autoloaders.main, for instance. And it is documented that you can access the autoloaders in these places and that you can use the API of the autoloaders for customizing things because that's another tension. The detention is well, we now have this autoloading mechanism and we have the API of Rails that has existed since the beginning. Should they be one-to-one? -one? Because that's going to be a tough game that we do not know if it makes sense. So by now, the compromise is we stick with the API that exists. And if the loader has more features, well, you can reach to the loader and call the API and that's it. So you see, there's work to try to put like a nice lace in the rail side, know that we have more freedom because we have only one node. That's my next interest. I really like that because I remember playing with something a little while ago on one of the gems that I was working on that wanted to add in the Rails engine some paths to eager and auto load when your Rails app booted. And there was something that I was trying to figure out where during the boot process do I need to do that? Because the paths get frozen at a certain point. 
And I needed to make sure they like added to that path before. And I think I talked to Raphael about that and he walked me through it. But going back to your point, it's really awesome to see those things like cash classes that were sort of a symptom of the underlying problem with the auto loader. And now you fix the auto loader and replaced it with site work. And now you can improve that interface so that it's much clearer to the users. And it like has all these downstream effects that improve the readability and the usability and in your documentation becomes easier because you have something now that can say like enable auto loading, yes or no, instead of cache classes, true or false. And I did the same thing where I'd read that every time and be like, I don't really know what that means. And I have to assume that it's something internal that there was just some sort of frustrating problem that this is a symptom of and we have to configure this. And luckily it was always a thing that was automatically done for you in the environments. So you didn't generally touch it that often. Those are those code smells or whatever that you see and you're like, huh, if it's poorly worded, sometimes that means the feature underneath is more complicated and it hasn't quite been solved ideally yet or something like that. I think we are about out of time. So I just okay. wanted to say thank you for joining us. Jason, and Andrew, do you have any last questions? No, I just want to say thank you. This was a lot of fun to just listen to kind of your take on open source and even just kind of hear more about auto loading because like Chris said, it's an amazing feat to like deliver something that is, for lack of a better phrase, like complete. But not only that, like, I don't think I've met someone in our community that's not just a breath of fresh air when Zitework came out. Like, it was just a relief and it's been really rock solid ever since. So I just wanted to say thank you for that and thank you for taking the time to chat with us today. Awesome, man. Thank you. Pre appreciate it. Yeah, I enjoyed listening. Every time I'm at RailsConf and you're speaking, I'm in the room. So thank you for everything you do and for coming on our show. I, yeah, like I said, I really enjoyed listening again. Thank you. You just reminded me of one application I had written was using Sidekick. And I realized that it was, it had a deadlock on loading classes or something. I read your auto loaded guide like 50 times trying to figure out what was wrong with it. And I had used one of the things in the gotcha section or whatever to like solve that temporarily and then Zitework came out and I was able to like remove all that stuff because the background jobs were racing to like load the same constant or something and basically deadlocking there. And I had the longest time trying to debug that and figure out what the heck was happening. And now it's not a problem at all. Everything works magically. <laughs> yes. So thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, man. <laughs> so where can people find you online? Yes. So my nickname is FXN, three letters. Uh, I am mostly on Twitter, uh, of course, GitHub. And yeah, Twitter is my main thing. It's like uh, for a freelance working at home since uh, I don't know how many years. It's like the way you get in contact with people every day and see what's going on. And so Twitter is the way to, to find me mostly, yes. Awesome. We'll have a link in the notes to your Twitter and to your website and everything. So just thank you so much. We had such a good time chatting and I'm sure we can Likewise. talk for another couple hours, but we'll, yeah. we'll let you get on with your day and get back to polishing Zitework. Okay, it was a pleasure. Thank you very much.